<laughs> Last class. <laughs> you have been very patient. Um, today, we're going to carry on discussing coordination and synchronization. And these words do not explain themselves. They can mean several different things. Um, but they're all, whatever way you understand them, they're relevant for understanding language in this broader sense we've been exploring. I've called it languaging. Um, we have contrasted the conventional view of language as something inside the head or in an individual mind with languaging as being a variety of ways in which languaging is a variety of ways in which people become non-independent, coordinated, and as you can see, these people are all very involved with each other. So it's this involvement we're going to look at. We've looked at some of this when we looked at rhythm. We've looked at some of this when we looked at joint speech. And we're going to start today by looking at a particular kind of joint speech. But this is only to be found in the laboratory. And I call it synchronous speech. I use my names here very carefully. Joint speech is whenever multiple people utter the same words at the same time. Synchronous speech is a kind of joint speech, but it is only in the laboratory. And what happens is I get people into the laboratory, I give them a text to read, and I say, please read this in synchrony. That means at the same time as each other. And then I go, three, two, one, go. So this is very different from joint speech in the church, in the courtroom, in the football stadium, in the classroom, or on the street. These people are doing me a favor. I asked them to read this text. The word, they don't care about the words. They have no agenda. They're not particularly angry, I hope. Um, but they can do this, and it sounds, so these are my two people, and uh, I go, three, two, one, go. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. When a man looks for something beyond his reach, his friends say he's looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like two people speaking together. It's not very surprising until you think about what they have just done. Now, when, whenever we speak, we speak in a way that is hugely influenced by the context. It matters who I'm speaking to, why I'm speaking, what time of day it is, what my emotions are, what I want to achieve. All these hugely matter. We started out in the first class noting I speak differently in the morning than in the evening. I speak differently to a police officer than I do to a dog. This is obvious, but that means that the voice and speech are very plastic. They can change all the time. And yet, with no more instruction than please speak together, people manage to speak in a way that gets rid of all of this variability. And they synchronize beautifully. And with a text like this, there's no beat. There's no artificial aid to synchronization. The words are the words that they're given. And still they manage to align their speech amazingly. We can measure easily how far apart things are in time. The average asynchrony, that means the average dis difference between them, is about 40 milliseconds. 
that's almost nothing. When you watch a movie, that's about the distance between one frame and the next frame. So fast you would never notice it. So, in many respects, the first experimental finding about synchronous speech is this. People can do it. This was not obvious. Some people have more difficulty than others. But in general, people can do this very easily with no more instruction than please do it. We found this several times in this lecture series that sometimes the most important things to observe are obvious. They are right under our nose. We just didn't think that that was something important that we needed to notice. So here's the second thing we can find in synchronous speech. People are very good at synchronization and we can measure a lot of things that might influence that. For example, after a pause, on average they are maybe 60 milliseconds apart, but within a syllable or two they're back to about 40 milliseconds. So a pause makes the timing of speech a little bit unpredictable. And this gives us a chance to explore by making experiments other things that might affect synchronization. Here's another, to my mind, very surprising finding. They don't need to practice this task. I think it's amazing that they can do it, but they don't need to practice. And if I get them to practice, they don't really like this, but I give them an hour, and practice and practice and practice, they don't get much better. They get a little bit better on a specific text, but as soon as I change the words, it's like they just walked into my laboratory. So that's remarkable. That means that they're doing something that is familiar to them and is intimately related with what they do normally. Now, I don't have a good explanation for why this is, but I think it's surprising. Now, we are experimentalists. We like to vary things. So here's an easy thing to vary. Instead of having them looking at each other, let's turn them around. Now they can't see each other. Even in the previous experiments, they could see each other, but they were reading a text, so they could only see each other out of the corner of the eye. What difference does it make if I turn them around? Well, it makes a small difference, but only at the beginning of a phrase, after a pause. So that makes about 20 milliseconds difference. What this means is that when they're about to speak, it helps a little bit to be able to see the other person out of the corner of your eye. That probably has something to do with breathing in, because you breathe in before you speak. And so that gives a little extra information for when we kick off. But once we go, it makes no difference. Now, the next obvious question to ask is, well, what kind of speech is this? Is it strange? Is it greatly altered? Would it be unusual if you heard someone speaking in this way? Well, we can measure these things. The prosody of synchronous speech is mainly unaffected. It doesn't sound peculiar. There are no obvious artifacts, no, nothing obviously wrong. People tend to speak relatively slowly in this condition. Different people have different preferred speaking rates. Some people like to speak very quickly all the time. Some people just naturally speak slowly. Synchronous speech, when asked to synchronize, they usually come in fairly slow. Some people are actually speeding up because they usually speak even slower, but usually synchronous speech is fairly slow. Here's a comparison of the same phrase. First of all, when someone just reads it on their own. Sermon emphasized the need for affirmative action. And here's the same person reading the same phrase together with someone. The sermon emphasized the need for affirmative action. Not a big difference. It's just a little bit slower. Now, there's no such thing as neutral speech. 
because we always speak in one context or another context. There's no default speech. There's no speech we can point to and say that is um, completely neutral, unaffected by context. That doesn't exist. And yet we find that speakers in this condition can remove an awful lot of expressive variability, the things that make speech so expressive. And this can be used for many purposes. So here, for example, this is data from an experiment in which, for reasons I won't go into, I asked people to read word lists. Phoneticians are strange people. I asked people to read word lists like this. Camper, batty, garden, border, carry, shadow, toaster, buddy. This was in an experiment where I was moving stresses around and so on. But we're only going to look at this very regular There are eight words in that list. So that means there are seven intervals between the words. And I measured, as you can see in the top right here, I measured the intervals from the beginning of these stressed syllables. In each word, the stressed syllable is the first syllable. So that's from camp to bat, from bat to gar, from gar to boy, and so on. So that gives me seven intervals. Now I had many such word lists very many. And over on the data plot, you can see on the top row, you can see data from reading these word lists alone. And on the bottom row, you can see data from reading these word lists together with somebody. And the only thing I want you to notice is look at how variable they are in the top plot. In each position, there's very many possible intervals. And look how much that variability is reduced in the bottom plot. It's gone way, way down. So, for some reason, I was interested in what, how people read a word list like this. And though, as a scientist, this variability is a problem. I can't see an irregularity there. But when I make people read it in a synchronous condition, the variability goes away, and I can see any pattern that there is in the data. So that means that this is a possible tool for phoneticians to get relatively inexpressive speech. If you're interested in studying language, studying language speech in a com completely conventional fashion, this is a possible tool to use in order to get very clean data and to make those aspects of the speech that must be there, that we would consider linguistic in the conventional sense, to make them clearer. So that's a possible tool for phoneticians. When we repeat things again and again, they become regular in some sense. And I want to illustrate this with an example taken this time not from the laboratory, but from prayer. And what I have here is a recording of an older woman in Ireland, the grandmother of one of my students. And she was a Catholic, so she used to um, say a particular prayer very many times. In the Catholic Church, this is a practice called the Rosary. And this one prayer Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <clears throat> That's the first half of it. <clears throat> it is repeated 50, 60 times when you say this, and she does this every day, so she's very, very used to doing this. So I had my student just record her saying it the way she normally says it. And we're going, to, she has a very strong Irish accent. You will not understand her words, maybe, but I'll. Just, I just want to point out something about the way she says things. So let's listen to her. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord's with thee, blessed are thou among women, blessed are thou among Jesus. 
got a strong accent, I think, to say, yeah. I'm particularly interested in the last phrase, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, which, and I'm going to play those words back for you, this is what you heard there. It's through time, Jesus. The next time she says that, it sounds like this. Let's throw time, Jesus. The next time she says that, it sounds like this. Let's throw time, Jesus. The next time she says that, it sounds like this. Let's throw time, Jesus. Those are the four recordings you just heard. They, to my ear, are identical. <laughs> I can hear no difference between them. I can see very, very slight differences. And the important thing is, this is not the way you would say those words if you were trying to communicate. You would say, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. You would not say, blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. But in joint speech, repetition is the norm. Clarity is not so important. Taking part is important. So here you can see how repetition and group repetition stabilizes something. So we see here in prayer something we just saw in the laboratory, which is the variability goes right down. So synchronous speech, although it has its limitations, there's no passion in the laboratory, it might be a good condition to record, for example, field data for new languages. If you are traveling around, trying to record to get samples of dialects, languages that have not been well studied, it's not obvious what you should record. People typically ask, they ask questions of their informants or they give them texts to read, but it's not clear what the right way to approach a new language is. So synchronous speech here, I think, is a useful tool for field linguistics, not just for, phonetic, for, for phonetics, because it reduces that variability that comes from the context that is not a necessary part of the language. And it makes that information that, in a conventional view of language that we call linguistic, it makes it easier to identify. So I think, even though this is not, it doesn't tell us it doesn't answer many of the questions we might have about joint speech. I think synchronous speech has its purposes. And I want to show you just a few more findings that we had with synchronous speech. And the first one needs a little discussion. When two people come into the laboratory and they speak in synchrony, they become very, very closely linked. They become very non-independent. They become very coordinated. Now, there are many ways in which you might understand that. You might think, ah, person one is paying attention to person two, and person two is paying attention to person one. And that sort of keeps them separate. Another way to say this that makes the relationship perhaps clearer is to say that they are coupled. That means they are non-independent. And this way, to me, seems more appropriate. Coupling is a term that we use to describe any two systems which become non-independent. The Earth and the Moon are coupled, for example. The Earth and the Sun are coupled. The growth of plants and the seasons, the cycle of the seasons, are coupled. When things change over time and repeat, any two such systems which come together may become non-independent. And we speak of coupling, or sometimes we speak of entrainment. These are technical terms from the language of dynamical systems. So I'm going to illustrate the notion of entrainment using a non-speech example using just metronomes. Now these metronomes have no brains, obviously. They are little machines, and each metronome has a preferred frequency, so it repeats something. And what you'll see 
is how when they are allowed to influence each other, they become coupled. can pass through the board. And that's a very small physical influence, but it's enough to bring them together. But you heard two different things here. On the one hand, you heard them coming together. They start off with very different relationships, and they all get into synchrony with one another. But you also heard each metronome fighting back. You heard them move in and out of synchrony. So they are not slaves. They did not become completely um, captured by this collective rhythm. And remember, these are simple machines. Now, when we speak of people becoming coupled, don't think of it as meaning that they are becoming slaves to each other or becoming totally captured. They remain autonomous. That is, they remain capable of ex expressing themselves, but they also, in a very important way, become non-independent. Now, all these terms are taken from dynamical systems. This is a way of studying human behavior, which is not psychological. I am not talking about uh, individual systems that are separate from everything. I'm looking at the way that systems come together. And I think this is very important. We'll be talking a lot about this today. Now, when people are speaking in synchrony, I'm saying they become coupled, much like these metronomes. Or I want to give you another example. And I know this happens in China as well as in Ireland. In a three-legged race, we couple two people together in an obvious way. We tie their legs together. That's obviously coupled, right? And when we do that, they can still run. <laughs> but it's not really simple. And nobody's very surprised when they fall, right? So you can still run when you're coupled together, but now you're not quite as free as you were if you run on your own which means that it's possible for something to happen that causes the two people to go down together. Now, in synchronous speech, there is a kind of error that we find, a mistake, that's just like that. And you never, ever find this except in synchronous speech. And when we see something like that, we go, ah, that might be important. So here I'm going to give you two examples of people where they start out obviously coupled, speaking together, and then something happens, a small error on one part, and they stop together abruptly. In this first one, subjects are saying the phrase, big dinosaurs and bigger Daleks in battle. I tell you, phoneticians are very strange people. I don't know why that, we don't care. Just listen, see if you can hear the moment at which one system falls apart and becomes Two systems. Big dinosaur is a big dialect in battle. Big dinosaur is a big dialect in battle. Big dinosaur is a big dialect in battle. Big dinosaur is a big dialect. Laughter usually falls. Here's another example. 
This is from the word list experiment, where we have people reading word lists. Shady, final, pattern, folly, bingo, <laughs> sorry. They start that fifth syllable, and they stop abruptly. Now, if you were speaking to someone and they stopped that suddenly in the middle of a syllable, you would turn around and look to see if there a sniper and someone shoot them. Because we just stop. It's not normal when we're... We just stop. And we certainly don't do it together. Right? Two people at exactly the same time. And yet we often find this in synchronous speech. This is, I think, very strong evidence that when we speak in synchrony, we are coupled, we are non-independent in a very meaningful way. So whatever way we want to understand synchronous speech, it will have to take account of this, or will have to reflect this non-independence. Non-independence is important. The kind of non-independence we see in the laboratory is different from that that we see in the wild. So when I ask people to read a text together in the laboratory, it's, they, they're coupled in a way that people are not coupled when they protest on the street, or when they speak prayers in the temple, or when they recite the Quran in the school. And that's a good thing. Because if everyone was saying a prayer together, and one person made a mistake, and everybody stopped, it would be impossible. So we should not mistake the laboratory situation for the naturally occurring situation. And I think it is no accident that many of the situations in which we um, plan to speak together, they make this coupling even weaker. So very often churches and temples have high domes, they are reverberant spaces. And the way the voice sounds, the voices, individual voices become indistinct. And that indistinctness is important. It's not a, as we would say, it's not a bug, it's a feature, it's an, it's an intention. And the reason is, of course, it's the collective activity that's important and not the individual. That's what these rituals and ceremonies are emphasizing, is our collective activity. Now, I want to show you one further result from synchronous speech, and I don't want to oversell this. It's about brains. Brains. I have a strange relationship to brains. Um, I've said that my preferred way to understand what's going on uses dynamical systems theory and is strongly empirical and is not psychological. Now brains can be interpreted in very, very many ways. Everyone agrees brains are extremely important. Some people believe that brains are where the person lives or their soul or their spirit or their mind. I'm not so sure. Um, so I want to be very careful with this. We're going to report on an experiment using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. That's in a scanner. And if you've ever been in a scanner, you know it's a loud and lonely place. <laughs> You're horizontal, inside a big tube. You can't move. You've got uh, big noises, magnets going on. It sucks. It's a, it's a terrible place for doing this kind of research. There's no piety or passion. It's hard enough in the laboratory. It's impossible to translate this, the feeling of a prayer or a protest into the scanner. So we need to approach this with caution. Reading brains is not a simple matter. This work was done in University College London by Sophie Scott and Kyle Jasmine, who's Kyle's PhD work. And Sophie Scott has just been appointed director of the Institute for Cognitive Neuroscience Sophie is a brilliant speech scientist who likes to study um, a lot of the things I'm interested in as well, things that are like speech but aren't really speech. So she studies laughter, for example. You may have seen a TED talk on her discussing laughter. 
She studies beatboxing, which is the production of musical sounds. All these um, things that are close to speech, but not quite speech. And she's a biologist, and I think it's no accident that a biologist would be interested in this kind of synchronous speech. This was obviously a big project. I only had a small involvement in it. And I don't want to make things too complicated. We had six conditions. We had a condition in which people in the scanner said nothing and did nothing. That's baseline. Then we had a condition in which people in the scanner spoke a sentence. They just read a sentence. They saw it. They have a little screen in there. A uh, sentence comes up and they read it. Now, I said you're not allowed to move in the scanner. But the way that this technology works is it records changes not of neurons, but changes of blood flow in the brain. And blood flow is very slow to respond to something. So if you read something, and then you stay quiet, the blood flow changes come in the next five seconds. So we can actually have, it takes about three seconds to read a sentence. So we can have people speak the sentence, and then we can measure them in the next five seconds when they're being quiet. So in this way, we get around that problem. So we can have them speaking. We can also have them listening. Because remember, in joint speech, including synchronous speech, people are both speakers and listeners. So we want to get a good idea of what it is, what it looks like if you're a speaker, and what it looks like if you're a listener. Then we have three conditions in which there's more than one voice. In this diff condition, the person in the scanner speaks one sentence, and the experimenter who's outside, but is connected using headphones and microphone, speaks a different sentence. So this is two voices at the same time, but they're saying different things. And then we have two conditions, these are the really interesting ones, where the subject speaks along in synchrony with the experimenter. But the difference between them is that in one, they're speaking with a recording of the experimenter. And in the other, they're actually speaking with a real live experimenter. And this is very important. Subjects never knew that there was a difference. They never knew there were recordings involved. And we asked them all afterwards. Nobody noticed that there were recordings involved. They always thought they were speaking along with the experimenter. But what we found was we could spot a difference between these two, so it really mattered whether they were couples to a live person or whether they were speaking with a recording. Think about this. Imagine shaking hands with a robot. The robot might have a planned handshake, but it's going to be mechanical. Whereas when you shake hands with a person, you're now linked and you're sensitive and responding to each other. This is true of the voice as well. If you're coupled with the voice, if you speak with a recording, the recording is not affected by you. It doesn't change sensitively. But if you speak with a person, you're coupled together. It's a very subtle but important point. So I'm going to have very briefly fancy pictures of brains. People tend to misinterpret these. I want to emphasize again, we're going to be cautious. The first one, what we compare here, I said we have a condition where people speak and where they listen. So we can put those two together, and we can compare them to those conditions where people uh, speak in synchrony with the experimenter, both the recording and the live condition. <coughs> what we're asking here is, is there a difference, uh, is, is synchronous speaking any different from just doing both speaking and listening at the same time. If synchronous speaking is just the, the sum, the addition of speaking and listening, there should be no big difference. There is a big difference. It shows up on both sides of the brain. It shows up in auditory cortex where you would expect it. Um, to a speech neuroscientist, these particular areas make perfect sense. This is what you would expect uh, to see in a brain that's doing a lot of auditory processing, I suppose. 
So the answer, the simple answer here is synchronous speaking is not simply speaking plus listening. And here is the more interesting finding. We wanted to ask, can we see a difference between the case where you're speaking with a recording and when you're speaking with the live person? And I emphasize again, the subjects did not know there was a difference. They never noticed. But we could see a difference in the brain. And these various areas are areas which, in which there was a difference in activity between these two conditions. Now, I don't want to put on my voodoo magic hat and start reading brains too carefully. To a cognitive neuroscientist, these are very, very interesting. This area over here is on the right-hand side of the brain. If it was on the left-hand side of the brain, we would call it Broca's area. It's on the right-hand side of the brain. I'm going to leave the brain scientists to figure that one out. This area down here in the front of the right temporal cortex is well known to speech neuroscientists. The activity in the brain looks different depending on whether you're speaking or whether you're listening to someone else speak. The activity in the auditory cortex and in the temporal lobe looks different. That makes sense because you hear your voice differently from everybody else because you hear your voice mainly through your skull, not through the air. So you can put your fingers in your ears and you can still hear your voice. And that's why when you first hear your voice on a tape recorder, you go, ah, it's horrible. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you because you've always heard your voice in a different way. Yeah. So it makes sense that there would be a difference between listening to your voice as you speak and listening to someone else's voice as they speak. After a lot of statistical comparisons, what we found was that when you speak in synchrony with a live person, your voice looks like anybody else's voice. It doesn't look like your voice anymore. Whereas when you speak along with the recording, there's that difference. You know that you're speaking and you're separate. So that means we have three take-home messages from this study. And I can't emphasize enough we have to be careful in interpreting brains. I'm trying not to read too much into this. What we see here is there's reason for more work. But the first thing is speaking in synchrony with another person is not just speaking and listening. That's a simple enough point. The second one is more interesting. It's that when you are together with a live person, and I deliberately use a, a, the word communion because it has all kinds of associations that I want to invoke here. When you are in communion with a live person, that's different from merely speaking along with a recording. It really matters when you're speaking along with a person. And the third one, and this I find very surprising, is that this known marker or index of a difference between yourself and someone else goes away in speaking synchronously with a live person. Now, if any of you sing in a choir, there is an experience, which I think everyone who sings in a choir is quite familiar with, and people who don't sing in a choir just don't know, or not reliably. And that is when you sing together, your sense of identity, your sense of being closed off, of being a separate person, is changed is greatly changed. This is one big reason people love singing in choirs. I say that because it reminds me of this third finding. I'm not saying it's the same thing as this third finding, but I'm saying that there's enough reason here to suggest that when we speak together, the brain activity is interestingly different, and we have good reason now to go and find more. Um, I think we've covered enough now about synchronous speech, um, which is just a laboratory task. It's different from joint speaking in the wild. 
It allows us to study some things. So this business of coupling is fairly mechanical. It's a mechanical business, and it's not terribly relevant to what goes on in the temple or the street. But it does provide the phonetician with a tool, which might be of use in studying certain kinds of phonetic pro properties of language, or in studying in obtaining useful recordings in the field in new languages. So there's that applied sense here. But synchronous speech, for all its problems, it's not the same thing as joint speech, it is showing us something rather interesting um, when we do things like this neuroscientific experiment. Now there is, in the world of cognitive neuroscience, there has recently become, a, 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 there's a great deal of interest now in studying brains of people as they interact socially. The history of brain science is one of studying isolated individuals. There are good reasons for this. The technology is very difficult. Scanners are big, you can't move, it's hard to record from brains. And if we go back 40 years, the earliest brain recordings really, I mean direct recording from the brain, was taken not only on individuals, but on unconscious individuals. Anesthetized cats have played a big role here. <laughs> so what we've learned about brains has undergone some transitions. When the early recordings were made of anesthetized animals, not behaving, not doing anything, we learned some things. But when the technology got better and we learned to record from awake animals, because this is mostly animal research, we found that the properties of the brain changed hugely. And that should be no surprise, because your form of being in the world is radically different if you are awake and behaving. What some scientists have begun to realize, and this is only in the last 10, 15 years, is that the activity in brains is completely different again when we are in direct social interaction with our fellow human beings. Again, this shouldn't come as a big surprise, but it's, it's another huge change in how we view brains. And it should, well, I don't think it has yet, but it should greatly alter what we think a brain is and what the relationship is of brains to minds. So social neuroscience is definitely something that is awakening a huge interest at the moment. I think synchronous speech has the potential to add something to that. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break there, and when we come back, we're going to wrap up, finish up this lecture series with a bit of a game. We're going to collectively look at some synchronization, just to see what we see, because that's been so much fun all along, hasn't it? It's just Let's just look at some stuff that we are quite familiar with. So we play a little game after the break, so 10 minute break. <laughs> Now, we've discussed a lot of things um, throughout these five classes. And I want to finish up with just a game, as I said, uh, of observation and discussion and, and thinking together. We have, um, throughout these lectures, we have contrasted a view of language as something about message passing between individual minds with languaging as a form of coordination among people. On the left you see someone trying to make a plant grow in a way that's not going to be very successful. That's not how you make plants grow. You don't point a gun at them and tell them. But that is the idea underlying the notion of control. When we speak of the brain controlling a body, we're treating it as if the body was a puppet. 
But the body is most definitely not a puppet. The body is a biological organism. And when we use metaphors of control, which are so popular in cognitive psychology, we do violence to the reality of the way that we are embedded in the world. In fact, biological systems cannot be controlled. They can be coordinated. Everyone knows if you want to make a plant grow, what you do is, like the farmer here, you create the correct context. You provide the appropriate context in order for it to develop as it will do. This is a view of coordination rather than a view of control. And I've pointed out that the technical language that helps us to view people in this light, view their relations, is not a psychological language. It's the language of dynamical systems. Now I want to take this coordinate, coordinative view and I want to ask about synchronization. Now, people use these words as if they were the same thing. And you can do that. That's fine. Coordination just means we're not independent. Synchronization, if you examine the word, it really means living in the same time or sharing time. But time is a complicated being. Uh, we can mean clock time, but we met phase earlier on. And when I walk, my legs are coordinated not in terms of seconds, but each leg is coordinated with the other leg. So the time of one leg is given by the other leg. When we speak of synchronization here, I'm going to be focusing on behaviors which are coordinated, where we see a, a, a stronger degree of coordination based on clock time. Um, and this is, um, this is just a way of educating my vision. And that's what I want us to do here, is to practice looking in a particular way. And I don't want to claim that when we see something that's synchronized as opposed to coordinated, that it's somehow this is more tightly bound or anything. I want to illustrate this with an example from dancing. When you dance the tango, from Argentina. The man and the woman have different roles. He leans over, she leans back. Yeah? He spins around, he stands in the middle. I'm not a tango dancer, I can't dance the tango. But they have different roles, but they are extremely tightly coordinated. And good tango dancers are inseparable from each other. Here's another form of dancing from North America called line dancing. You have people with cowboy hats on and they're all doing the same thing at the same time. And typically they're not very highly coordinated, but they are synchronized in the sense I'm going to use. I'm going to use the term synchronization to mean doing the same thing at the same time. So on my rather strange definition here, the tango dancers are not synchronized. But if we have a room in which there are 20 tango dancers, this pair could be synchronized with that pair because they would be doing the same thing at the same time. This is just a language issue. I'm not claiming anything about what's going on in the world. I'm using this very self-consciously because when we insist, as I will now, that synchronization is the same thing at the same time, then that forces me as, an, as a scientist, as an observer, to say both what I mean by thing and what I mean by time. I have to be explicit. And in a world in which people happily speak of things like behavior, which are notoriously ill-defined and full of observer bias, at least this will keep me honest. I will have to say what I mean by thing, what I mean by doing the same thing, and what I mean by the same time. And I do not mean that the tango dancers are in any way less coordinated than the line dancers. In fact, the opposite is undoubtedly true. But this is a tool that we can use for looking at 
uh, particular kinds of joint behavior. And we're going to look, we're going to go through a couple of videos, and as we do, we're going to have a bunch of questions, which I'm going to refer to here. And here are the questions. In each case, we're going to ask, how tight is the synchrony? That is, are they millisecond by millisecond identical, or is it just kind of loose? Then we're going to ask, what are the things that are synchronized? Is it faces, hands, whole bodies, more than that, less than that? And then we're going to ask, what's the basis for the synchrony? So how, how, how come these things are doing the same thing at the same time? This is really important. I don't want to, you to think, as one so often might assume, that synchronization is one thing. There are many kinds of synchronization for many kinds of reasons. And I don't want to restrict the space of explanation to minds and bodies. We will have to take account of the environment for various definitions of environment. Inertia, gravity, elasticity, physical properties are going to be important here. Chance may even be important. You never know. Then when we got examples of people or systems doing the same thing at the same time, we might ask, how strong is the coupling between individuals? So if one of, for example, if one of them makes a mistake, will that affect the other one? We'll see there's great variety there. And then we can ask, this is a different question, what's the basis for the coupling between individuals? This is not the same question as what's the basis for the synchrony. So the reason we have these questions is to make ourselves sensitive to the variety of ways in which we may appear to be non-independent. Not to suggest that there's one end. And then maybe then, uh, in some cases, we might be able to ask, what's the purpose of the synchronization? Why is it there at all? Is it intended? Is it unintentional? So those are the questions. Now we're just going to look at some videos. Yeah? The, my first is one of my favorites. I think this might even be from the Olympic Games, synchronized swimming. It's my favorite Olympic sport, of course. <laughs> so, how tight is the synchrony? You have to practice an awful lot to get this good. That's why it's an Olympic sport. It's still not possible to be completely tightly synchronized second by second. The environment is challenging. You're in water, sometimes upside down. <laughs> Your ability to see other people is restricted. So, tight but not very tight. What is synchronized? Dance moves of the entire body. Yeah. So it's whole body synchronization here. And we have, in this case, eight people who are synchronized. Sometimes in synchronized swimming, there'll be periods where one person does something and the other seven maybe do, you know, fan out. So it's not always um, every individual synchronized together. There are patterns that we can build. How strong is the coupling between individuals? Now, I would say not very strong. You have to practice this an awful lot. And if one person were to make a mistake, you might not even notice because you're busy doing your thing. Notice that there is, oh, I missed one, what's the basis for the synchronization? It's not just practice, there's music. Right? There's music that's providing a beat. Even with the head down, I think they're aware of this. And when they come up, there's definitely awareness of music. They're using the music to synchronize. That's one of the great things music is there for. So, the apparent synchrony between individuals is sort of indirect. It goes from me to the music to you, and not directly from me to you. If one person has a heart attack, God help us, while they're doing this, the other people will carry on until someone notices. 
And what's the purpose? Well, in this case, it's sports, it's performance, it's fun. So, that's just to practice. Let's have a look at some more. Here's some cats. not take this one too seriously. That music was added after the fact, obviously. I don't know if parts of this video have been speeded up or slowed down. We need to learn to be careful with media these days. All kinds of things are possible. But those cats are very synchronized. <laughs> They're paying attention to something, which is probably a person doing this with something that's, that they're all looking at. So you can all see that they're synchronized, right? How tight is the synchrony? Extremely tight cats. <laughs> right? It's not the case that one moves and then the other one moves. They seem to be locked into this one behavior. What's synchronized? Well, it's their heads, isn't it? The head, head and necks are synchronized. Their whole body is just sitting there. It's not the whole body. They're paying attention with their head and their neck. So we can see there's differences here. What's the basis for the synchronization? Well, they're looking at a common focus. They're looking at a common thing. That's different from the synchronized swimmers. They were not looking at anything in particular. Uh, presumably there's a person directing them, so they're being controlled by an external puppeteer. The strength of the coupling between individuals, I don't think these cats are paying attention to each other at all. They're kind of paying attention to a common focus, so there's not much coupling in here between individuals. What's the basis for the coupling between individuals? Well, there's no, no, no obvious coupling between individuals. And what's the purpose to make us laugh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a media thing. Okay, here's another, it's a, it's a, this is a, it's not even a video, but it illustrates something which is rowing is one example of a collaborative, synchronized behavior. Uh, it's, it's standing here for very many kinds of collaborative, synchronized behavior. Um, one person here is at the front, that's called the, the coxswain. They are directing this and keeping people in time. They may shout, they may use a bullhorn. In a slave ship, they might use a big drum to keep them in time. So, how tight is the synchrony? Very tight. Yeah. If you get this wrong, well, you can't really get this wrong. If, if to row is to be in tight synchrony. What's synchronized? Well, the top half of the body. Maybe the legs as well. It's primarily the movement of the oar through the water is the principal focus of the synchrony here. And it engages the whole body of the rowers. And there will be additional coordinative relationships with the coxswain, but by my strict definition of same thing, same time, we might say the coxswain is merely coordinated. What's the strength, or what's the basis for the synchrony? Well, I mentioned the possible role of the coxswain, but you can row without one. That's not necessary. The movement of the boat through the water, the physical properties of the boat, the weight of the oar, the resistance provided by the water, these are all extremely important. You, if you've ever rowed, you know you're not free to do it any old way. You are entirely constrained by the physical properties of the task. The strength of the coupling between individuals is actually quite a lot. If one of these individuals makes a mistake, it can stop everyone else. More like synchronous speech. Yeah? They may fall over. It can really be disastrous. So successful rowing requires that everybody be involved. The basis for the coupling, this is physics is the main thing we have to appeal to here. We have to appeal to, as I said, the weight of the oar, the water and so on. And the purpose is locomotion, is getting, getting this, moving this boat through the water. So you can see this is a very different story from the cats and a very different story from the synchronous swimmers. Here's a nice one. <laughs> How 
How tight is the synchrony? This is incredibly tight. <laughs> These are really, really, really perfectly aligned. And indeed, that's the point. They practice to be perfectly aligned. What's synchronized? Falling. <laughs> this is synchro diving is nothing other than synchronized falling, right? You launch yourself, you're going to arrive at the bottom. You can do something in between, but you can't stop yourself falling at that stage. So this is synchronized falling, and the basis for the synchronization, well, there's an awful lot of practice. There's not necessarily any music here. This will not work if you have a big fat guy and a little short small guy. Right? They have to have matched bodies. Those diving boards have to be matched in their properties. They have to lift off with a similar velocity, with similar force. Then there's all the practice of the twisting and turning in the air. And that is practice, but once you lift off, you cannot change anything about the amount of time it's going to take to land at the bottom. They don't have parachutes. Right? They're in falling. They're in free fall. So the strength of the coupling between individuals, zero. Notice that. If one of those does something wrong or dies halfway, it doesn't affect the other one in the slide. They have no influence on each other going down. They cannot do anything to each other. So zero, this is very interestingly different from some of the other ones. What's the basis for the coupling between individuals? Well, there's no coupling between individuals. They have to practice this and practice this and practice this. The basis for the synchronization is this physics. Again, the properties of the diving board, the mass of the body, the uh, time to fall, and so on. So, very, very different. Here's a fun one. Lots of politics going on here in the uh, during qualifying and behind the leading three, Saron still holds fourth. Look at Killy. Killy looks so very, very good. He's really a man coming of age. Oh, both Just, of them! Dear me, that was unbelievable. Doing a row. I wonder. I wonder if there's something down on the track to put them both over like that together. Please. I don't believe so. At Synchronized crashing. I collect synchronized, I've got synchronized farting, synchronized sneezing, synchronized coughing. Synchronized crashing is a weird one, isn't it? How tight is the same thing? Well, if you, I've watched this video many times, they do, they, they go at the same time. Amazing. But nobody wants this to happen. The commentator says, I wonder, is there something about the track that caused this? The answer is yes. <laughs> Everything about the track caused this. This was entirely driven by context. These people didn't want to do anything. They're engaged in a similar activity. What synchronizes not just the bodies, but the bodies and the motorbikes. And the crash, the whole crash is synchronized. Because they're do they start off doing as it was, doing the same thing at the same time. Taking part in a race is to do the same thing at the same time. So they're already locked in this form of very heavily synchronized behavior. Something perturbs it, and because they're so locked into a synchronous behavior, they crash synchronously. Quite astonishing. Purpose, no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> no coordination between the individuals. Very, very different. So trampolining is an interesting one. There are a limited number of sports that are performed synchronously. So we've seen synchronous swimming, synchronous diving. You don't get synchronous archery, and certainly don't get synchronous football. <laughs> you do get synchronous trampoline. Yeah. This is very similar to the synchronized diving. But there's an interesting twist to this, which is the role of the trampoline. Because it repeats, right? You boing, and we do it again, and boing, and we do it again. There's no music. I don't think they could do this to music, because 
It's not the case that they're choosing their rhythm. The trampoline is enforcing their rhythm. The elasticity of the trampoline is enforcing the beat here. You couldn't do this to music. And in the diving case, music would be absolutely pointless. There's nothing you can do to music there. So once more, we see the physics of the situation is extremely important. But because of the re repetitive nature, there might be some coupling between individuals. They could pay attention a little bit to each other. If one of them, made, one of them fell, the other would stop his routine, right? In the diving, well, of course you're falling, but if one goes, goes, if something goes wrong, there's nothing the other one can do. There's no influence. So they're all quite different. And this is you know, one of my favorites. I've mentioned this before, synchronized disobedience in class. Stop being synchronized, so we stop the pace. I love these girls. I encourage all you students to do this to your teacher. <laughs> um, it's a very funny example, but it's also quite instructive. How tight is the synchrony? Not very tight. <laughs> they haven't been practicing this for a long time, and there's lags between them. It's not very tight. What's synchronized? Sort of dance movements. The dance movement. What's the basis for the synchrony? No, there's no music. Every girl is paying attention to what the other girls are doing, and it's spontaneous. It's improvised, so it changes as it goes along. So this only works if you pay attention to what the others are doing. The strength of the coupling between them. Not very strong, I would say, but it is the case here that there's no external timekeeper. There's no, not much physics involved, right? It's just this bonding between the girls. So that's the basis for the coupling. So the purpose here is really important. This is group bonding. And although this is fun, it illustrates just how much this synchronization or coming together and doing the same thing at the same time makes us into tribes, makes us into groups, makes us into the various collectives that we are. So 
I think that's the most important thing about this. This is not external, it's all person to person. So it's all horizontal coupling. And it has this fun aspect to it that bonds the girls. And of course, the teacher is the enemy. The teacher is the outsider. The teacher is not involved. Yeah. <laughs> They're all very silly examples, I admit that. Here's another silly example. <coughs> Got some nice music to go with it. Rats. Um, 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 Two rats really have it in for each other. I don't know what's going on between them. Um, how tight is the synchronous? Well, they're quite synchronized. <laughs> they are responding very sensitively to each other. Although there was music to accompany it, they're not responding to the music. There's no music present. So here we again have a case where there's no external timekeeper. There's no physical constraints that's bringing this about. This comes down to the connection between the individuals. And it's these two specific individuals. You see them in their cage, and there's other rats around. The other rats don't do it, but these two, they lock together. We sometimes find ourselves engaged in behaviors we don't want to engage in, because the interaction has a life of its own. So. It's possible to be involved in a conversation that you'd like to leave. Both people want to leave, but you don't quite know how to get out of it. Or you're walking down a narrow corridor, and you both go to what? You go to you know, uh, you're trying to get past each other, and you end up in this repetitive dance. It doesn't last long. These rats, for some reason, have a persistent kind of it's it's like fate. They're destined to act like this against one another. Neither of them is particularly aggressive to the other. They both seem to be on the defensive, but they're so alert and so wary that they get trapped into a form of social organization. Now, again, it's a humorous example, but it serves to alert us to the fact that in our forms of collective behavior, our forms of communal behavior, we miss something if we think of ourselves as controlling our behavior. Because sometimes the behavior controls us, sometimes the context controls us. Those motorcycles, context completely controlled them. So we've seen a range of examples, and although some of them are humorous, they do illustrate some very serious points. Synchronization is not one thing. Periodicity is important for some of these behaviors. It's important for the trampolining, but not the diving. 
It's important for the synchronous swimming as an external timekeeper. It's important for the rowers. It's built into the pattern of rowing. It's not important for the rats. Um, okay. External constraints. So physics played a huge role in some of these, but not others. We shouldn't assume that because we're seeing synchronized behavior that this is either the plan or necessary. It's not necessarily imposed by the physics, but you have to take account of the physics. If you see synchronized behavior, if you see people engaging in behavior that is repeated across individuals, there's a lot of things to look at. And that's really what I wanted to get at here, is not to suggest that synchronization is one thing, and certainly not to suggest that brains are doing it all. We've looked at all this. I'm sure brains are very important in what we saw. But so is the weight of the ore. So is the threat from the other rat. So is the, the, the fun of disobeying your teacher. These are all important. It's not all brains. And synchronization happens for a variety of purposes. It means a variety of things to participants. And it means a variety of things to onlookers as well. So the teacher may not have found that those girls were uh, engaging in very positive behavior. Again, I encourage you wholeheartedly to behave like this in class. <laughs> I want to show you, to finish up, an example of languaging without language. This is a series of little loops from video we recorded myself and two colleagues, Nick Campbell and Jens Edlund. We took an apartment, we rented an apartment for a few days. We put some cameras around in the room and some motion tracking devices and lots of microphones. And then we just sat down and we talked for two days. We talked and we just talked about stuff. We had no plan. We, in the second half of, the, of day two, we took out some wine and we got a bit drunk. And we just talked, and we just talked, and we just talked. There were two students with us as well, so sometimes it was five of us, sometimes it was four of us. There was no agenda. And the first thing we talked about at the start of the first day was the equipment, and the microphones. But that gets boring after a while, and then you talk a bit about work, and then you talk a bit about play, and you talk a bit about your students, and you talk a bit about your everything. And I just want to show you small glimpses of two people who are, the two students, who are very much taking part in the conversation, and they're not actually saying anything. I want you to look at how non-independent they are, and how, much you, how clearly you can see that they are knitted in to a larger conversational structure. I've put them in a loop. That often helps to see some things you wouldn't normally see. Sometimes it's also useful to observe at different speeds or upside down in ways that you know, stop you seeing normally. These are just four excerpts. Here's another four. I just want to show you that this is not um, entirely unusual. You see the way they respond at the same time in a similar fashion? Head turning is obvious. There goes topic or speaker. And in fact, if you look at the tennis match and you look at the spectators, they're all doing this synchronized because they're all watching the ball. But conversation is much, much more than this. So it's also, look, when they laugh, they both go back together. They both respond oh, emotionally together. This is what language looks like when we stop thinking of syntax and morphology. This is languaging. And that's been sort of my point here. We have very urgent questions about what language is. We use it, and so it's part of the fabric of our lives, and we need to understand it. And there, the stuff about syntax and morphology and phonology is very important. But we have another reason 
We need to understand our place in the universe. We need to understand our place in the order of nature. We need to understand what kind of an animal Homo sapiens is. We need to understand what happened to our species over the last not very long period of time. 50,000 years maybe? 100,000 years? We're not sure. Because something happened that changed not only us, but changed the planet. Not necessarily for the better. And as things go forward, as societies change, wars happen, climate change happens, we're going to face huge challenges in understanding the human social order. We are going to have to understand how we form allegiances, how we develop insider-outsider relationships, how we coordinate, bring people along, how we alienate people. Now, if you only ask about message passing, you create a very useful story. But if you want to ask about what happened to our species and what's important for our forms of social organization, then I think languaging becomes extremely important. It's important to realize that the whole body is involved, that the eyes are involved, to ask what does it matter that we're in a face-to-face -face situation, that we are present to each other. We need to explore these coordinative accounts, and my favorite one, joint speech, more. I suggest that there's an awful lot of work to be done. So you've come on a long journey with me, and when we started out, I said, I don't understand everything about this story. I was telling the truth. <laughs> I do not understand everything we're looking at here. Um, and I have tried to avoid confusing or, uh, people with equations or technical language. I've tried to avoid sounding like an authority. I am not an authority. I do not know what's behind all this. But I do know that we can learn to look better. Uh, that we can learn to ask different questions. And a lot of what we can look at is right in front of our eyes. It's interesting to stick people into scanners and look at what's going on in brains. There's a role for that. And we should do that. But there's an awful lot more to see. And sometimes it's just in the everyday thing. So, I'm going to stop there and thank you all very, very much for allowing me to speak and to language at you. <laughs>